at least you can pace yourselves uh, in terms of the uh, the four uh, the four lessons that I uh, I want to take you through if, uh, if time permits. Um, so the specific project at uh, Canadian Lawyers Abroad that relates to my presentation today is the African and Canadian Women's Human Rights Project, and it is a um, a unique project that uh, that works collaboratively with NGOs, uh, women's human rights NGOs in our partner countries in Africa, and human rights uh, academics in our partner countries in Africa, and, uh, and the lead human rights NGOs and, uh, and academics here in Canada. And the project was formed in response to requests from our colleagues in Africa <coughs> excuse me, for, um, for support with developing and applying substantive quality analyses that could be used to advance women's human rights in the African context, using the Canadian experience with substantive equality as the reference. So Canada really has done um, some, some good work in terms of um, advancing women's rights using the law and developing substantive equality theory. What's interesting to us, um, particularly in this project, is the reciprocal nature of the um, of the relationships. We are um, we're interested in the potential transferability of the of the Canadian experience, but um, but particularly interested in the critiques of what we've done in Canada, uh, what's worked and what hasn't worked. Most recently, what hasn't worked, um, why and uh, and why not. And using the fresh perspectives and the new analyses that our African partners are offering us to uh, infuse the Canadian women's equality movement with new energy and uh, and new uh, new analyses, because if you're familiar all with Canadian substantive equality situation, there's been a, a sort of regressive movement recently and a retrenching of uh, of our rights as a result of a very conservative judiciary and federal government. So all of that is, uh, is the background in terms of the specific project. The, um, the case study or the story that I want to tell you about this morning relates to a project uh, that I was working on in Ethiopia and, uh, and resulted in a, um, a placement in, uh, in the fall in October of uh, 2008. And so there were four sort of main lessons that, um, very practical lessons that that I think we learned out of the um, out of the training opportunity that we had uh, relating to this uh, this placement. So they are um, the importance of gender equity and specifically local based gender equity. Uh, the importance of a community connection and establishing a community connection prior to undertaking the uh, the education initiative. The importance of grassroots involvement. And that was important both in terms of developing our substantive equality analysis and ensuring that the, uh, the human rights training and education was um, uh, was legitimate and uh, had credibility. And then finally, the importance of um, uh, incorporating comparative analyses into uh, into our work so that um, we were not uh, we could avoid the pitfalls of cultural relativism in terms of. Uh, in terms of the application of the, the substantive quality analysis. So those are the four points. I don't know if I'll get through them, but we'll see. So, um, so this, this case study relates to, uh, to a placement in Ethiopia. Specifically, uh, we were asked to develop human rights training relating to uh, female genital mutilation. And the, the group that, uh, that we were working with was a group called, uh, is a group called Ameria. Ethiopian Muslim Relief and Development Association. So this uh, this first photo just uh, is, it gives you a snapshot of the context in terms of the geographical location that we were placed in. And Merida was working with um, with pastoral groups in the district of Afar, which, if you're not familiar with Ethiopia, is in uh, sort of the northwestern part of Ethiopia. Very remote, uh, very uh, very isolated, and that was sort of critical in terms of some of the uh, some of the the challenges that uh, that we were facing. So this is a typical kind of other sorts of stuff. I'm actually technologically challenged too, and I'm blaming it on my broken arm. So that's <laughs> like very convenient. Um, so this is. Uh, 
this is the the desert community uh, just near Wahar, where we um, where we connected when we first uh, when we first got there. And I, I included this picture because this is the local schoolhouse that uh, that had been developed and built by another group that had been in the community years before. They were um, they were a Christian group that had uh, that had been working in the in the area, and they built the schoolhouse, which was actually never used. So it's um, it's actually used as a uh, as just a, a reference point in terms of um, in terms of getting directions because you can remember how we got there. But that's really its main utility now. It's just as a signpost. But um, but it relates to my point in terms of community connection. I think because the uh, because it was a Christian group that was working with this primarily, if 99% of the population was Muslim, there wasn't a lot of credibility, and they didn't connect very well with the community. So they never found out exactly what was needed, and they did what, what they wanted to do, which was build this schoolhouse, which came in useful as a signpost, but not much else. So, um, so that was really critical learning from that experience in terms of the, um, the limited utility of, of their contribution. Also really important in terms of female genital mutilation and, uh, and the, the justifications that are sometimes used, in the religious justifications for, for female genital mutilation. The, um, the Christian-based uh, human rights training that had been provided in the past had been uh, rejected out of hand, and they had met, um, those human rights educators had met with a fair degree of hostility because the training was based in, um, in Christian, uh, in a Christian perspective. So, um, so I was working with a Muslim-based group and I think also as a heathen, there was no chance of me actually imparting any kind of religious uh, perspective into my training at all. So I'm fairly safe in terms of uh, in terms of that for me personally. But um, but the fact that I was working with a Muslim group really increased the credibility, I think, of the uh, of the education that uh, that we were providing. Um, So that's just another picture of the schoolhouse. Really, that's the uh, the closest the kids get to, to the education. There is uh, is just hanging around outside. They um, this just shows you that's like it's pretty dilapidated. It's just not used. It's also it was I thought it was about 400 degrees when I was there, but they reassured me it was only about 40 degrees. But inside that schoolhouse, it was uh, it was unbearably hot. You just couldn't couldn't hang out in there. So this is the community. And this is, as I said, it's a pastoral community, so they uh, so they move around. This is you know, another reason why the schoolhouse that was built by the um, uh, by the Christian group was really not very useful because it doesn't move, and these people move on a on a regular basis. So um, so one of the things that was really great in terms of the, the work that we were able to do was to to actually um, apply a grassroots connection on the ground. So. Incorporated into into our work, into the uh, the training that we did was uh, two or three days actually living with the people out in uh, out in their community, and that was really critical in terms of ensuring that the um, that the training that we were developing, which included representatives from the from the community, was actually going to be relevant in terms of how it uh, how it got fed back into the into the community. So we um, so this is us just uh, just up and being introduced. This is um, this is some of us outside of the uh, one of the homes of the uh, the local uh, the local people. These homes are um, and this is relevant in terms of the gender the gender based uh, analysis and the, the practicality of, of gender based education. So these homes are transported. Um, they're dismantled and transported by the women as they move from location to location. It's the women who do primarily all the work. It's kind of hard for me to figure out what the men are doing, but. Uh, but the women are like 100% consumed uh, during the day with um, with domestic duties and with uh, with caring for the animals and uh, and gathering water and, and all the uh, practicalities of their subsistence lifestyle. So um, the fact that they were actually here meeting with me was it was considered this like VIP opportunity and that they uh, they took the time off from their their regular work to, to meet during uh, during the days that we were there. But um, but it's the 